I'm wondering how many people here, um, when you've been to the beach, like to scour the beach for that special little treasure. I know I do. When I go to the beach, we often walk along the beach, and I'm always looking to see what's laying on the beach. And you find all sorts of interesting things, some some gross things, and all sorts of things. But then, on occasion, you find some really fun pieces. And so I have this random little collection, assortment of things in a cup at home. And some of them are pieces of shells that have been tossed and turned by the waves that are smooth or have a certain shape that's interesting. Some of them are rocks. Some of them are old pieces of glass uh, that have been worn smooth by the sand. And it's such a fun little, for me at least, it's like a little treasure hunt. It's like, ooh, I get to take this. And this has been around, and I don't know where it's been, but I know it's had quite a journey to get here. I was thinking about this because if those little pieces of rock and shell could tell their story, it would probably be a fairly turbulent story. It would be a story of some pain and some hardship, some overwhelming pressure that got them to that point. Sometimes challenging journeys lead us to amazing places. And today we're going to talk about prayer and we're going to talk about receiving God's peace. And at least in my experience, the journey of experiencing God's peace sometimes is a pretty anxious one. It takes some time getting there. So today we're going we're gonna to be reading from Philippians 4. Before we read our, our few verses that we're going to look at, I just want to talk briefly about the context of uh, this letter to the Philippians. It was written by Paul to the Christians in Philippi, and Philippi was an important uh, city. It was a Roman colony, in fact, and so there were many, uh, it was a privileged city. There were many people who lived a life of privilege and were quite wealthy there. There was a lot of retired military um, that lived there. There was an a military presence there. There was a lot of Roman citizens there that sh- that had privileges that others did not. If you go back and you read in Acts 16, when Paul and Silas went first to Philippi, we read the story of, of Lydia uh, converting and, and believing in Jesus and her whole household. We read the story of Paul healing an enslaved girl and her masters being furious that they had healed her and inciting a mob against them and, and Paul being thrown into prison. We read of, of Paul and Silas in chains and prisons in the middle of the night praising God, even in that situation, even in that turbulence, in that distress. They were praising God and praying to God, and then God miraculously opens the doors to the jail, and, and the, all the prisoners could be free, and the, and the jailer is upset, and then the jailer uh, speaks with Paul, and he too comes to believe in Jesus, and his whole family is baptized. And then we read in the story, it almost sounds like a, a drama, you know, as the story continues to unfold, um, those, the leaders who had thrown Paul and Silas and so mistreated them and thrown them into prison realize that they're Roman citizens and they had known that before. And, they, and, the, and so then there was this apology to them and they're released. So all this kind of the backstory of this letter that was written to the Christians in Philippi. In Philippi, there was great persecution and resistance to Christianity outside of the church. And we also read that internally within the church, there was some internal strife, some disagreements that were affecting the whole church. And so Paul writes this letter to the Christians to help them um, live more like Jesus. These are the words that they need to hear in this context. Today, we're going to be reading Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. 
But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I have lots of Bibles at home um, and some of them are really old. The ones like my Bibles from when I was a teenager to when I was a kid. Um, But in all my Bibles, these verses are highlighted. I think it might have been one of the first verses that I highlighted, the ones that really spoke to me. And I love coming back and, and diving into this because there's a whole lot in here. When we look at the first few verses, verses four through six, there's three initial commands that Paul gives. And so in the Greek, they're imperative, they're, they're actual commands. And in this context of internal church strife and persecution outside the church, this is what Paul writes to the Christians at Philippi. He says, rejoice in the Lord, be gentle, and don't be anxious. And I find that interesting. That's probably not what I would have chosen to write if I were writing this letter. letter. And so I want to look at those. Rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give things. Acknowledge the good things that God has done and is doing. So rejoice in the Lord and then be gentle. Um, I think the NIV says, let your gentleness be evident to all. But this is talking about how we treat others. Be gracious, be kind, be gentle, even in the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the disagreements. And then Paul writes, don't be anxious. And that's when part of me just kind of wants to scoff a little bit. Ha, really? Don't be anxious? Like, you can't just tell someone, don't be anxious, right? It's way easier said than done. And I'm thinking there's legitimate reasons to be anxious for the Christians at Philippi. Like there are some hard things that they are dealing with. Um, if you, if you know me a little bit, a little bit more, you're probably not surprised to hear that I was quite the anxious child. I was, uh, what some might call a worrier, you know, I was, I was a little bit uptight as a kid. And I remember at one point, um, being told, you know, just stop it. Just stop worrying. (laughs) Well, um, probably spoiler alert, that didn't help, right? (laughs) It didn't help for someone just to say, just stop it. I remember as I, well, I, I don't know if I had all these thoughts at that time, but thinking back, I'm thinking today, you know, what I really wanted and what I really needed at that time when I was so anxious was to be pulled into a hug, was to have someone put their arm around me and say, you know what? I've got you. Whatever it is that comes, whatever it is that you're going through, I've got you. I see the things that you're worried about. I see the things that are making you anxious, and I will walk with you, and I will take care of you while those things come up. And so I'm reminded of that as I read this passage. I'm reminded of that as I read this passage because there's so much to be anxious over in this world. Anxiety is, is an interesting uh, word. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of different definitions that you could give for that. I'm thinking right now in terms of excessive worry, uh, of this fixation, this, this loop, this negative loop on all the things that could happen or that are happening that are negative. All the worries, all the what ifs in life's when we fixate on them, they can be quite overwhelming. 
we like to travel, and, and even even when we just travel to Seattle, um, but even other places we've experienced this, I'm sure you have as you travel, and you're in the mountains, and you're going to go through a tunnel, right? And the world is big and open, and you can see the whole side of the mountain, and you can see the sky, and it's gorgeous, and then there's a tunnel ahead, and all you see is this circle, right? And then as your car drives into the tunnel, it's like the world disappears and all you can see are the dark sides of the tunnel. And there's an expression, tunnel vision, where all you're, you're focused on this one thing. But when you're in the tunnel, it seems like the world outside is gone. And then as you're traveling through the tunnel, finally, the end appears and, and you're, all your attention is drawn to that, right? Oh, there's the light, literally, you know, drawn to the light at the end of the tunnel. And as you get closer, that light gets bigger, that opening gets bigger. And then once you pass through it, the whole world opens up again. I like to think of anxiety as when I'm driving through that tunnel, when all I can see are the walls of the tunnel, it, it's, it narrows our vision and it's hard to see and even recognize that there's a whole other world out there. So what do we do? We live in a world in which there's a lot to be anxious over. What do we do? Verse six. So Paul has said, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And then verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Paul says, bring all that anxiety to prayer to God. All the things that we're distressed over, all the things that our heart hurts over, all the messed up situations that we see or that we are a part of, in every situation, bring that to God. Whether we feel in control or out of control, whether it's an easy situation or a hard situation, in every situation, Bring that to God. And what I see described here is really a life of prayer. No matter what we're doing, no matter what situation, always praying and always opening ourselves up to God, walking with God. Paul says to present our requests, to to both acknowledge and surrender our wants and our needs. God, this is what's going on. This is what I want. This is what I need. Walk with me through this. And then a really interesting phrase in here. uh, Paul writes, with thanksgiving. So don't be anxious. Instead, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I'm thinking, why with thanksgiving? Why is that such an important thing? He started this section with rejoice in God. And I think it goes links back to that because the act of rejoicing, the act of giving thanks requires us to widen our tunnel vision. It requires us to remember and to see what God has done and what God still continues to do, all the good things that God is bringing about in our world. So Paul says, rejoice, be gentle, don't be anxious. Present, pray, pray to God, present all your requests, and then the results of this in verse 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. And peace is this idea of wholeness. Peace is well-being. Peace is an experience of being cared for. And this is why even in the turbulent, we can have peace because we can be cared for in the struggles. And Paul says this peace is of God, meaning it's from God, that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who made peace between us and God, this peace comes from him. 
This peace transcends understanding. It's got some sort of divine, mysterious quality to it. It's, it's beyond what we can conjure up ourselves. It's beyond what we can force ourselves. This peace is uniquely from and of God. And, and so it, it doesn't make sense according to human reasoning. It's beyond what we understand in some way. So this peace is of God. It transcends understanding. It will guard our hearts and minds. And I think that's an interesting language, given, given the fact that this is to the Christians at Philippi, and there was a large military presence there. That word to guard is a military term, as if the peace of God is, is guarding. It's doing battle against the forces that would want to disrupt that peace. And then a very important phrase, a qualifier, that this peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That is our connection to Jesus, our submission to Jesus. It is in that that we experience God's peace. And for someone who at times struggles with anxiety, as I'm sure all of us at some point does, this is a beautiful promise. What a beautiful promise that in the midst of all the hard things, in the midst of all our worries, the peace of God can be experienced in Christ Jesus. Paul continues in verse 8, and he says, choose what to focus on. Think about things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Intentionally orient your thoughts on what is good. And this is way more than just a be more positive, self-help type message, right? This is, this is about an invitation to prayer, an invitation to walk with God, to focus on God and what God is doing. And so again, it takes us back to how Paul started this section. Rejoice in the Lord with thanksgiving. As we genuinely walk with God, we can see more of what God is doing. Our eyes are open to the kingdom of God and how God is bringing about his kingdom here on earth. Our perspectives are widened and we see the transforming work that God is doing. And then Paul will continue and he'll say, put these things into practice. And as Paul has been modeling and teaching these things, he says, follow follow me in that. And then again, at the end, he repeats the promise, and the God of peace will be with you. So not, lo- not only will the peace of God be with us, but the God of peace will be with you, will stay with you. I love, I love this passage. It's so, so beautiful. When I zoom out a little bit and I look at it as a whole, I see this invitation to a life of prayer. And it's an invitation to process our anxieties and our worries and our struggles with God. That we don't have to do that on our own, but rather we are invited to walk alongside God and process all that with God, to partner with God in the good work that God is doing. And this is no small invitation because it's not like, hey, at this time I want you to do this. It's, it's a life in every situation. Pro- process life with God. It's an ongoing conversation and communion with God. Um, there's another uh, Bible version. It's called the message. It's, it's a paraphrase. And so uh, it uses um, more language that's more familiar uh, for us. And I love how the message um, says, says this verse. He, the message says, let petitions and praise shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. And I like that idea of, of let your prayers, your petitions and praise, let your prayers shape your worries, or let your petitions and prayers shape your worries into prayers. So taking our anxiety and shaping that into prayers. It's not that we ignore it. It's not that we pretend it doesn't exist and we plaster on a fake smile. 
but rather we process that with God and shape those into prayers. And the promise is the peace of God. As we continue, I want to give two, um, two, two simple warnings, a, a caveat, if you will. Um, when we read this passage, a simplistic and surface level understanding of it and advice taken from it um, can be really unhelpful and at times even harmful. For instance, the, the churchy um, response sometimes can be, hey, don't worry, just pray and give it to God. Whereas that is profound in that statement without digging deeper on how to actually live that out and and, and how to hold the tension of living in such a messed up world that hasn't been made new yet. This just becomes a churchy way of saying, you know what, just stop it. (laughs) And that's just not helpful when we say that to each other. The other caveat is this, that just because God is inviting us to pray through our anxieties and promises the peace of God when we do, that doesn't mean that God doesn't also work through other means. God is big and powerful, and he works through a lot of other means. For instance, um, some of us may, may need to take anxiety medication. And there's a lot of stigma around that and a lot of shame around that. And I, I would plead with us not to let a simplistic understanding of this passage bring more shame. That God works through all sorts of different ways and invites us to walk with him in all sorts of different ways. So today I want to recognize that there are anxieties. We all have them. We, we, we hold this tension. We live in this tension of living in a broken world. And God is inviting us to walk with him, to partner with God, to journey with God. And instead of uh, taking away the message, oh, just stop it. <laughs> I want us to really internalize um, this invitation that God is inviting us to come to him and to walk with him, that God is, is putting his arm around us and drawing us in for that hug that we need. He's saying, you know what? I see your worries. I see the things that you're anxious about. I understand. I've got you. I'm going to walk with you, and I invite you to walk with me. I'm never going to leave your side. And God invites us to never leave his side. God invites us and he says, look to me and see what I am doing. I'm doing amazing things. God is healing and restoring. God is bringing about reconciliation. And so we get to rejoice in what God is doing, all the good things. And God is saying, be gentle with each other. Be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with each other. Be gracious and be kind in the midst of hardship, in the midst of all the things that are, that are bringing about anxiety. Be kind. Instead of fixating on our anxieties alone, we're invited to bring them to God, to, to wrestle with these anxieties in prayer with God. And, and I love the, the word wrestle. Because it's not super, it's not like a quick and easy thing. It's like, boom, laid that at Jesus' feet, now I'm done. <laughs> I wish it was that easy, friends. But it's really not. We wrestle with things in prayer. And we're invited to do this in all different situations. And God creates space for us to process what's going on. God creates space to go back and forth and talk through them. And, and, and to hold the tension of a hope for a new creation and a new world while living in a world that's still being made new, that's still messed up, where there's still uncertainties and unknowns and suffering and pain. And God says to us, let me carry the heaviness of those burdens. Let me give you my peace, the peace that passes understanding, the peace that you can only find in Jesus, the peace that is of God. 
We just finished um, a series in John, the Gospel of John, and so I was reminded of several different verses in John. One of them was John 14, 27, when Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. So friends, we're invited to a life with God characterized by prayer and characterized by the peace of God. And this invitation is one that we accept um, on a continual basis. It's an invitation that we must continually accept because it's a lifelong journey. So today as we as we close, we're going to close with communion. And, and I love, I love communion. And, and today as we receive communion, we want to open ourselves up to receive Christ, to give ourselves to God, to surrender to God's plan and purposes, knowing that trust, knowing and trusting that they are good. Because when we were at a complete loss, to rescue ourselves. Jesus chose to enter into humanity's suffering, to enter into the suffering as God incarnate, fully human and fully divine, to live a life completely surrendered to God, a righteous and just and loving life, to die a cruel death that he did not deserve, to take on the consequences of humanity's sin, and offer us an abundant life instead. To take on himself the shame, our shame, and instead invite us to a place of honor before God as God's beloved children. Jesus conquered sin and evil on the cross, uh, reconciling us to God and making peace between us and God. And then he rose from the dead, conquering death itself and offering new life and hope. So today I want to invite our um, communion servers up here. And today as we receive communion, we remember that the bread represents Jesus' body and the juice represents his blood. I want to invite us to open ourselves up to receive the peace that Jesus offers. Peace with God as we receive forgiveness and grace and also peace with ourselves as we receive our, our identity of being the beloved of God, the beloved children of God. And peace with others as we respond to God's invitation to live out God's love and grace in our relationships. And so in just a moment, we're going to pray. And, and after I pray, um, I invite you to stand and you can come down the center aisle and move to the sides and there's going to be communion served on both sides and then go back to your seats using the side aisles. We take communion to remember what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing. He offers forgiveness for our sins and invites us to live with him in a new life. And so today I invite us to open ourselves up to peace. This is an open communion. So whatever age, whatever, wherever you're at in your walk of faith, you're welcome to take communion if you would like with us. I invite you to stand as we pray. Lord, we thank you for this invitation to walk with you. We thank you for this invitation to bring our whole selves before you with all our anxieties, with all the hard things that we're dealing with, Lord, and to process them with you. We thank you today, especially what you're, for what you've done on the cross, how you've made peace, between humanity and yourself, taking on our suffering and our shame. Lord, we thank you for the offer of new life, a new life that can be peaceful, a new life that is loving. God, teach us what it looks like to really wrestle in prayer with you. Teach us what it looks like to hold on and to walk with you. 
Lord, teach us to stay on this journey with you, that we might know you more and know your love more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to close with the words of Jesus in John 16, 33. May these words bring hope and peace for this week. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will, have, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen.